welcome to the wide world of esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Noor. Today we're talking with Uzair Hassan of Esports How about mobile esports. Welcome, Uzair. Welcome. Uh, thanks, Catherine. I'm very happy to be here. Fantastic. Okay, so what is Esports How? So Esport How is an esport and gaming consultancy. We work with businesses on a global scale to help them um, position themselves into the esport and gaming space. Because what a lot of businesses are starting to realize is that with their current line of products and services is that they're missing to hit the younger demographic. And they're also noticing this growing trend in, in cultures to really be involved in gaming. So a lot of these businesses are now wondering um, how can they get their current line of products and services into the field. So that's what my business primarily does is help work with those businesses to see if this makes sense for them and their business model, and then how they can position themselves into the overall esport and gaming scene. Okay, and we will return to talk more about that in a little bit, but we're here to talk about mobile esports. Yep. Okay, now mobile esports is pretty exciting. And what makes it so exciting? Is there? Oh, like mobile esports, in North America, most people just aren't aware of how big it really is. So when you look uh, in the East, it's really dominated uh, all over, just like, like, just like for any esport game, you kind of see uh, NA is slower. And it's like um, Jeff Chow is, like, puts it really nicely. Mobile esports now is what, we, what sports players used to see esports as, like fake fake sports or fake esports in this case. But in actuality, mobile esports has really taken um, you know, the east by storm and we're just seeing that transition into the north, especially with the um, revenue streams on the gaming side and the gaming industry. Mobile, mobile gaming generates more revenue for the uh, publishers than PC, console, and VR combined. So it's, it's massive. And the esports side is reflecting that too, especially in the past three to five years where we've really started to see big titles like PUBG Mobile, uh, Green as Free Fire, and um, a lot of other titles really starting to build out their esports scene. Okay, so I understand esports is huge in mm -hmm. Asia, huge in India. Yeah. Um, what other what other areas of the world it has esports really I mean mobile esports really dominated? A lot, a lot of countries. So we see um, like China for sure. China's honor of kings is massive. It's a massive cultural phenomenon. Uh, Vietnam, Brazil. There's um, really just anywhere outside of North America, mobile esports has really taken storm, and a lot of it is a because of uh, yes the mobile technology is cheaper. So people that are not in the, as well of a financial state as we might be in North America, they have access to mobile gaming, but it's not only that because a lot of these countries as well, they, they have a bunch of PC bongs and gaming uh, arenas that they can go play in. But what really makes mobile esports special is that um, it's the social aspect. So if we think uh, back to uh, Pokemon Go, what made Pokemon Go so big was that, you know, you knew your friend was playing it and everyone else was playing it. And mobile, uh, Pokemon Go made a few mistakes where they weren't able to keep that traction going. But we're starting to see a lot of other games, especially in different countries, where um, like PUBG Mobile, for example, is really, really big in countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, where um, they, because of the social phenomenon and the ability to make relationships with that um it, it just really helps it take off and if you look at honor of kings for example a lot of people uh in china make relationships from honor of kings because you get to know the um like the players and people really build strong relationships not to mention that mobile esports unlike most other esports segments is predominantly female there are more female players than uh male players in most mobile esport games and why would there be more um, uh, females playing mobile esports um, than possibly uh, PC or console? Yeah, it, it's hard. It's hard to say straight up. But one of the uh, predominant reasons that it seems like is mobile and the way they structured their games differently than PC is that the barrier of entry is much lower. It's much easier for someone to enter the uh, overall game. And well, like obviously PC early on was especially uh, targeted towards the male demographic where we see like if you look at honor of kings and the way they built their characters and their branding it's a lot more friendly um a lot more uh, attractive to this uh female audience that pc and other games fail to tap into where 
these mobile titles are actually doing really well because of this low barrier and that they're just not tapped into from the other segments of the industry. I would say that's why it's not a like we're seeing females starting to balance out even on the PC side. It's just because of how mobile was so open to everyone is that females that usually wouldn't typically play on PC are now playing mobiles on their phone instead of a uh, computer. It's kind of um, mobile uh, esports. Is, is that kind of a gateway to console or PC or is it something that would just be in itself? Like once you start yeah. playing mobile you'll just continue to play mobile or do you just move, where would you move on typically you would see them sticking to the mobile title we don't i'm not not that i'm aware of there's any um, real statistics showing that they're transitioning and that's because of the con cultural phenomenon uh, mobile esports actually didn't really take off until three years ago versus if you look at pc esports you know that's been going on for a, at least a decade now a bit more than that um where mobile esports, because of that social aspect, because when you go around, you know your friends are playing it and you want to engage with your friends. And there's so many different opportunities that are coming from it. We don't really see like players really transitioning out of it as mobile is the inferior platform. Rather, it it because a big part of it is when you're going out for events or when you're on the um on a commission, you're able to just play at that point in time. And we even see this at live esport events where the fans, you know, while they're waiting are actually playing with the people um, in the audience and just enjoying the game live, which you can't do with uh, PC games, which makes mobile so powerful. And so just like, again, I love the example of Pokemon Go because it really showed the power of mobile and the interconnectivity there. So I, I feel like mobile is really the direction we're going and North America's only like two steps behind like we always are. Is there a difference between um, a mobile game, like for example, PUBG, if you played it on mobile versus mm -hmm. playing it on PC or console, would there be a difference? The main difference would be that the games are shorter simply because you're playing typically playing it on the go. The like kind of feel of the game is also different based on the actual um, controller you're using being a mobile device. But um, and what we're what we originally saw in mobile esports is the transition from uh, like PC games and console games onto the mobile platform. Now we're starting to see publishers making dedicated games for uh, mobile just because of how big it is from a revenue standpoint. So uh, currently it's just that transition and those games are typically shorter, but now we're starting to see more dedicated games uh, for the actual mobile console. Now on the, the mobile games, are there a lot of interruptions of commercials um, and ads? <laughs> No, uh, not on uh, competitive uh, esport games. The, the games that make uh, about a billion dollars, majority of them are actual co competitive esport mobile games. So, um, and what we see there is a majority of that revenue is coming from microtransactions, not really the advertisements. Um, like uh, Supercell does this really well with their Clash Royale, Clash of Clans, uh, Brawl Stars, their line of titles where they have a lot of good um, in-game purchases and they make a lot of revenue through those. And we're seeing that uh, microtransactions dominate the mobile esports scene, especially. And it's so easy uh, to make that microtransaction. You just connect it to your Google Play, you just click a few buttons, and then it's it's very seamless. And that, that's part of the reason why it's so much easier for them to make a lot of money on mobile. So are people actually viewing and playing esports mobile yeah. uh, in a mobile fashion? Yeah, a uh, hundred percent. Um, what we see even like apps like Instagram, these mobile uh, streamers and players get a lot more uh, interaction on these social platforms that are typically on your phone because these audiences are based on uh, mobile. And yet yeah, there's a huge, huge viewership. If you look at free uh, greenhouse free fire, um, if you compare their peak viewership to uh, like the top games, they're number two right behind League of Legends. And I believe they also occupy the third and fifth spot according to eSport charts. So yeah, the viewership in mobile is very, very big. And because it's primarily those players are playing on mobile is that now their uh, social media is connected there, the notification, and they have a lot large, large uh, interactive uh, base there as well. And, and you know, I, I do have to admit that I do have uh, Twitch and Discord and and uh, other games on my phone um, that I may not have on my laptop or a PC. Um, would that be kind of a common situation? Yeah, yeah. You typically see that uh, people use those kind of apps on the go, and um, 
especially for mobile gamers where you're you know everything's kind of on your phone uh, specifically those in different countries that are leveraging their phones more so on commute and trying to get involved in the community and culture because uh, again mobile esports dominates the culture the one powerful aspect to mobile esports is that not only are you playing it people a, a large party are playing it now they're dominating the culture if you go to china and see again how honor of kings has really taken over it is um, phenomenal and we're very interested to see like last year call of duty uh, mobile their downloads in north america was off the charts in 2019 I, i'm i haven't checked the 2020 statistics but i'm sure it was very much high up there too and now we're waiting for really league of legends wild rift to add something um people on the mobile side are really really excited to see how that might really shift uh, north america's thinking to incorporate more mobile esports you know um it seems logical that mobile would be huge and that it would have been huge earlier than than just in recent years because people around the world have mobile phones, but they may not have access to laptops and PCs. Is that right? Yeah, uh, that, that is. See, that is a that is an aspect for sure but it's not a massive uh catalyst to mobile like it does help especially when we see countries like china uh sorry not china like india like pakistan that aren't um that don't really have that many computers but they have a bunch of pc banks and uh, uh arenas where they could come down and play mm -hmm. but it's a large part of it is the social aspects that allow that interconnectivity there um that is because of the accessibility in north america there is that kind of stigma towards uh pc players and console players versus uh mobile gamers and that like stigma like compared to sports and esports sports players saying esports isn't a real thing we kind of see the same thing here uh, like i mentioned before mo well e typical esport players and gamers comparing a mobile gamers as not typical gamers and to to be fair in their point since 80% of the downloads from uh, mobile games come from casual games, you could make that argument, but 50% of the playtime or a little bit more than 50% of playtime on all mobile games in general come from these competitive esport games because people are soaking hours and hours into these games trying to get as uh, high of a rank as possible. So you, you mentioned um, North America quite a bit and yeah. are you including South America and Central America in that or are they into mobile esports? I know Brazil is pretty big into the esports scene. When I'm saying North America, I'm specifically talking about uh, like North America, US, Canada, because that's a lot where I do my own business and my research lies. I haven't looked too much in South America uh, and Central America, but I do know that like countries like Brazil uh, do have a pretty big mobile scene. It's just really this first world uh, Western, uh, you know, North America. We don't see mobile just taken off just yet. And are there any other reasons why that you haven't mentioned of, uh, about why North America is so far behind in mobile? It's 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 interesting just because of the like the cultural differences in uh, the Western society and like how everything just structuralized and obviously the fact that we kind of have uh, PCs and consoles very readily and people are very interactive there. I'm I honestly I'm not like. 100% sure beyond the cultural reasons and the fact that the stigma be between mobile and competitive that we don't see massive North America blowback besides the support from uh, publishers. So like we saw Supercell uh, enter, I believe it was in 2018 and they pulled out from North America. Uh, I think it's uh, Tencent is actually starting to push more into North America. I believe they built up their partnership in 2018 or 2019 with CSL to build out i know on the eastern side first but they're they're expanding uh throughout and it's um so there's there's potential in north america the, in the publishers the main catalysts aren't haven't pushed it hard especially tencent tencent has really dominated like they own shares in Garena, uh which is free fire and they have um like Ar arena valor they own um obviously pubg mobile honor of kings uh game of peace they really dominate the mobile scene and that's why riot games is really entering the scene because of the uh, pressure that Tencent is applying, although they they were uh, refusing to do that earlier. Be, like there was an interview, I think it was in 2017, where uh, an executive from Riot Games was saying, uh, you know, they had some tension with Tencent, their 
and if you aren't aware, Tencent owns uh, 100% of uh, Riot Games, and they had some tension there with their parent company just saying that we don't want League of Legends on mobile because you can't recreate that experience. And mm -hmm. thanks to the new technological advancement, the um, empowered battery life, the better CPUs, the better GPUs internally, and the smaller platforms, and especially the increased size of the platform, right. it allows for that um, uh, like ability for publishers to do a lot more. And that's why Riot Games is entering the mobile scene. And like the, the thing about mobiles is that Honor of Kings was one of the earlier mobiles to enter the mo a mobile scene. And the issue they kind of came in with was they started off by making a mobile 3v3. Mobiles are typically 5v5, like we see with Dota 2, League of Legends, um, but they tried to do 3v3, it didn't work out. And once the, and that was because of technological restrictions. And once the technology allowed them to expand, they went from almost going bankrupt into an extremely billion dollar profitable uh, mobile game, which has done a phenomenal job for them. And Riot Games is really looking to capitalize on that. And we've seen just currently in their beta, their success, even from the North America side, although it's not out in North America, they like they've said uh, so many people are using VPN to play the game because they're just so interested in seeing, you know, how Riot Rift is. And they've done a phenomenal job differentiating the games and making it interesting for even PC players who want to give it a try. Sure. And we do have questions from viewers. And let's go mm -hmm. to those because I, one of the questions from our viewer is something that I have as well. So I'm going to, okay, so the question is, um, okay, I want to start streaming mobile games. What is the best phone? And that leads to my question is, can you use an iPhone, an Android, both? And, and also, can you use an iPad or a tablet? Yeah, it would depend on the game. Typically, though, across the board, it seems like iPhones are your best bet as far as streaming these mobile games. Um, if you're, especially if you're using in the, the the way you typically would stream them is using an Elgato, a capture or a different capture capture card. You connect it directly to your computer software, and then from there, you're able to get that footage and the video from your computer as well to stream uh, your gameplay there. So, and iPhones just seem to do the best. And when you're streaming tournaments, well, either you're using an emulator if your computer can run it. That's how bigger uh, publishers are streaming their tournaments. But if you're obviously if you're just a player not using a PC emulator to stream your tournament or your game that you're playing, you would just use a iPad. iPad's uh, ideal just because of the uh, the ratio, and it depends on the game. But like if we're talking about Clash Royale, Clash of Clans, I believe PUBG Mobile also streams their stuff on a um, tablet of some sort. So that that is usually your best bet. Okay, and then um, another question from the same viewer was, how do I record myself? Yeah, so uh, like if you're using the Elgato capture card, what you would want to do is from your same PC that the Elgato is, or, or the other, or the capture card, whatever capture card you're using is connected to the PC. Using the software, you just uh, capture an input from your um, camera that's connected typically to your computer, and then also your phone. You tip you typically have a central operating system that captures it from your phone rather than having to capture it from your phone directly. You can also use applications on your phone. Uh, I can't remember the app right now off the top of my head, but there's a good one that um, allows you to do that over Wi-Fi, so you don't even need a capture card, but you just generally need a, uh, a system to pick up that footage. And then same thing for your face is that it just all goes through your software and that streams to the platform that you want to stream on. Terrific. And another question uh, from a viewer is, Pokemon Go was popular um, was a popular augmented reality AR game. Do you think an AR game can become a practical esport? That's that's a very interesting question. I think uh, Pokemon Go they just lacked a lot of functionality that people were looking for when the game initially came out. Um, so, like obviously, the inability to battle or interact with individuals was uh, harmful to it. As far as AR games, we like. I guess even taking it a step back, VR games, um, we, we see a growing popularity as they become more accessible. That's currently their biggest weakness is that they're not accessible. But a lot of these uh, VR arcades, what they're doing is that they're hosting tournaments there where they would typically give you a bulk amount of uh, hours you can play. So you're able to play in uh, excessive time. And then once that's done, people love, excuse me, competitive VR games. And um, so as far as AR goes, I would, I would, it would depend on how the publisher kind of set it up, but there is that again optionality if the com competitive nature is there and it's able to really um, 
bring people together in a competitive light where people want to compete with each other. And also the viewability is very important for any esport title. If, if those elements are able to be brought in, then there is that possibility for sure. Okay. So you've been mentioning like um, PUBG and um, some other titles. Um, what are the largest mobile esports uh, titles currently? Um, are there others besides those you've mentioned? Like so, Fortnite? Uh, Fortnite, Fortnite is a mobile platform, but it's like it's in, it's um cross platform. So like I don't believe I might be mistaken. I'm pretty sure I'm not here. Where mo uh, for, mobile Fortnite isn't separate. Like you can play mobile Fortnite, and because of the cross platform, you're playing with the other players. Where I believe the competitive side, there's no differentiation there. Um, I I know in Worlds they don't do it. I don't know if they do it in any other side, but um, like ten ten cents uh, Arena of Valor is. A, another platform which which it was a MOBA but now they stopped supporting it because of Wild Rift and they want to put their 100% support there because they see it uh, really blowing up. There is um, Vanguard that's fairly big. There's um, all the Tencent games or Supercell games are fairly big. So we got Clash Royale, Clash of Clans, Brawl Stars. Um, there's Mobile Legends Bang Bang, which was arguably one of the earliest mobile esport game titles. Um, and that, I, that one is also a MOBA, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. But there, there is a handful of platforms. Also, uh, COD Mobile, I can't forget that one. That one, especially in North America, is really, in 2019, started to take off there. Where, and now we're starting to see more publishers trying to enter the scene because, again, every game that really makes a billion dollars within the gaming industry has been, or mobile gaming industry rather, has been these competitive esport titles ex with some exceptions like Candy Crush and other casual games. Majority of them are uh, these competitive esport titles. Sure. And where do you see mobile esports progressing in the next five years? So mobile esports, I, I personally, and this is arguably by some, like uh, people have different opinions on this. I would see mobile esports really starting to blow up in North America. I think, and this is again, my personal opinion completely. I think COVID hurts mobile esports just because of that inability to leverage it on the go and to be able to see your friends playing it and trying it out. Um, but like I would see within the next two two to five years that mobile esports starts to really blow itself out within North America. I see some unique publishers coming into the scene. Uh, again, what we've really seen up to now is people are publishers replicating their PC game onto mobile and mobile just has a different feel where they have to really change up the game. I see new games, just entirely new games coming into the actual mobile scene that really work well with its quick pace, uh, more casual on like commuting and like when you're just waiting somewhere in those type of games, I see those uh, really coming out and a lot of different publishers competing for that market because right now Tencent is really the one that dominates it majority, uh, majorly. So we're just trying to see, you know, who else is going to come in and be a major contender. But mobile esports is really going to, in my opinion, blow out and continue to be a massive, massive source of revenue for these publishers in the next two to five years. So do you think that pandemic has impacted either the popularity or the um, kind of necessity of doing um, mobile esports at all? Yeah, I mobile esports in the areas that it's had culturally dominated haven't necessarily suffered a great deal from it. I think the further ability to expand it in countries that um, aren't necessarily mobile dominant have probably struggled. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to say that from specifically the data just because I, I haven't fully looked at the 2020 data as far as how, how it's grown, because obviously as we recently transitioned to 2021, some of that's still coming together. But um, the but the sides that we've seen like in Eastern countries, they definitely have not, like mobile esports didn't suffer just because of the cultural dominance that it's had and the player's commitment to that specific console um, to play on. Okay. So let's shift to eSport How. Tell us more about what you do uh, in uh, that with that company. Yeah, so eSport How is a consultancy. So we work with different businesses, typically to help them position themselves into eSports or see how they can leverage eSports um, as a whole to hopefully change their line of services or um, 
products or make a new line of service and products to generate revenue for them by leveraging this uh, growing phenomenon. And like we see, um, you can brand a, like an average chair to be an, e an esport chair and then up, up market by a significant portion. Same thing for uh, gaming drinks and different peripherals where people um, are looking into, you know, how can they enter this scene with these uh, changes? Sure, and I think that that's really important because there are so many people, so many companies and people who have, you know, like, um, I think, you know, it's very clear that obviously um, sports, traditional sports have had challenges in the past year and that companies are starting to see that um, perhaps they should find a, um, a, a place to put their products for their business. And they notice esports is growing exponentially. So do you help um, educate uh, those companies and people about eSports to help them understand how to enter the space? Yeah, like 80% of my job is really education. It, it was really surprising to me, especially in uh, the age group that I'm in and the, the, you know, the group that I'm in is to kind of be, you know, blown away by the fact of how much people really don't know about the esports scene, the gaming scene. I always go to networking events and like I would say that I, I'm an esport consultant and there's always that handful of uh, people that say, what is esports? And they keep like, they have no idea what's coming up and that really it hurts them to not know this growing trend because it's massive. You would think that, you know, every, everyone's aware that Fortnite and these different game platforms, but they're not aware of how big the esports segment um, really is. And it's my job is to educate them, have, have them help, help them understand the cultural phenomenons, the differences between different games, their esports scene, and what if their um, current line of products and services would make sense to enter that scene to uh, best, you know, help them as far as their profit and how they're growing their businesses in the next three to five years to follow this growing trend in tech. Okay, so I'm going to give you the last word, Uzair, about uh, how um, how people can contact you and any last words you'd like to tell us about mobile um, esports. Yeah, so uh, if you're interested in contacting me, like if, if you run a business or you're looking to enter the esports scene as a whole, you can go to my website, esporthow.com, or you can email me at user, use at A-I-R dot H-A-S-A-N at esporthow.com, not esportshow.com. Uh, and um, yeah, I'd be happy to help and give free consultation anytime. That's terrific. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you as a guest today, Uzair, and I appreciate it. Uh, we've I've learned a lot about mobile esports. Happy to hear that. It was a pleasure to be on. All right, thank you, everyone, for joining us today on the ThinkTech Live um, stream, ThinkTech Hawaii Live Streaming Network, and thank you to our viewers who sent in questions. Next week, I'll be talking with Dr. Ryan Tarau about esports psychology. See you then.